Good morning, welcome back to part three of this series of video tutorials on chapter eight of Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, in this chapter, we're looking at the climax itself. We're looking at the moment in which Utterson and Paul break down the red baize cabinet door with the ax and they enter into Je Jekyll's cabinet and they see the body of Edward Hyde. And I'm going to be looking at how Stevenson builds that tension and suspense to that crescendo uh, in the climax of this novel, which again for a first time reader would be incredibly tense, incredibly mysterious, incredibly ambiguous, because of course Stevenson has managed to maintain the central mystery at the heart of this novel all the way through from chapter one to now. Again, for a first time reader, you are unaware at this point that Jekyll and Hyde are in fact the same person. You think that they are two separate individuals and that, uh, and, and I suppose throughout the novel, you have been questioning the relationship between the two characters. Are they lovers? Are they, uh, does, is Hyde blackmailing Jekyll for something he did in his past? Uh, What's the relationship between the two? That's, that's the central mystery that has been in, hopefully at the heart of uh, this novel, if you're reading it for the first time. So we're going to be looking at how uh, Stevenson builds up to this climax where Utterson charges that door down and we're going to be looking at the description of Jekyll's cabinet. Um, I think this is a very, very clever piece of writing this. So we're going to be reading up until the line, he was looking at the body of a self-destroyer. So I'm going to start by talking about the narrative um, structure and then I'm going to look at this, this uh, passage in, in more detail. So first I'd like to talk about narrative structure and, and this chapter, The Last Night, it represents the climax of this novel. This is the moment, of course, where for the first time reading it, it feels as though we were about to encounter the mysterious Mr. Hyde, we were about to capture him uh, as the door is, is, comes tumbling down. We, we expect Utterson and Paul to apprehend the villain and perhaps then to learn about his backstory. Obviously, that doesn't happen. Uh, there's a plot twist, uh, a huge one, which is that Hyde uh, commits suicide. He has a file in his hand. So that we're, we're, we're never going to meet Hyde. We're never going to see him taken into custody. What's important about this, stru this, this chapter in terms of the stru narrative structure as well is that it, the rest of the novel has followed a linear narrative. So it's been told chronologically from beginning to end. And as I said in the previous video, this marks the end of the narrative in a sense, because chapters 9 and 10 are, of course, flashbacks, or rather, they are accounts from different perspectives. So chapter 9 will take us back to roughly chapter 6 in the chronology of the story, and that will be Dr. Lanyon's narrative. And chapter 10 will really take us through the entire story again, but from the perspective of Dr. Jekyll. Uh, and we talked about how Stevenson uses various eyewitness accounts, various statements, various uh, documents in this novel to give us this impression of a paper trail uh, and again to conform to this genre of the detective novel. So I think it's really important to think about narrative structure, thinking about how Stevenson maintains our interest, how he builds tension and suspense uh, in, this, in this scene. So I'm going to now read the passage that we're going to focus on in today's lesson and then we will go through it in more detail. Jekyll, cried Utterson with a loud voice. I demand to see you. He paused a moment, but there came no reply. I give you fair warning. Our suspicions are aroused. I must and shall see you. He resumed. It's, if not by fair means, then by foul. If not by your consent, then by brute force. Utterson, said the voice, for God's sake, have mercy. Ah, that's not Jekyll's voice. It's Hyde, cried Utterson. Down with the door, Paul. Paul struck the axe over his shoulder. The blow shook the building and the red baize door leapt against the lock and the hinges. A dismal screech, as of a mere animal terror, rang from the cabinet. Up went the axe again, and again the panels crashed and the frame bounded. Four times the blow fell, but the wood was tough and the fittings were of excellent workmanship. And it was not until the fifth that the lock burst in sunder, and the wreck of the door fell inwards on the carpet. The besiegers, appalled by their own riots and the stillness that had, been, that had succeeded, stood back a little and peered in. There lay the cabinet before their eyes in the quiet lamplight, a good fire glowing and chattering on the hearth, the kettle singing its thin strain, a drawer or two open, papers neatly set forth on the business table, and nearer the fire the things laid out for tea. The quietest room, you would have said, and, but for the glazed presses full of chemicals, the most commonplace that night in London.
Right in the mist there lay the body of a man sorely contorted and still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back, and beheld the face of Mr Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes of the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with a semblance of life, but life was quite gone, and by the crushed file in the hand and the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew that he was looking at the body of a self-destroyer. I think the first thing to say in regards to this passage is to talk about the presentation of Utterson as being a heroic figure who is swooping down uh, like a knight in shining armour to rescue his friend, but just at the wrong moment. And that, I think, is supported by how Utterson's been presented throughout the novel as someone who is keen to protect his friends, keen to support them, keen to uh, offer them a helping hand when they are in trouble, particularly Henry Jekyll. At this moment, we can read Utterson as being a detective figure, arriving at the crime scene uh, to break the door down and apprehend the villain, uh, who he presumes is, is Hyde, uh, who he thinks presumably has killed Jekyll. So I think it's interesting how Utterson is presented as this kind of masculine, heroic figure uh, who is, the, is a force for good by the end of the story. What's interesting later in the passage is how Stevenson maintains ambiguity and suspense uh, initially it's through that description of the voice and the voice has created an ambiguity and suspense throughout this chapter because of course we know that hiding behind the cabinet door is this mysterious figure presumably Mr Hyde and the fact that Stevenson only addresses the, or only describes the character speaking as the voice creates or, or rather maintains that ambiguity maintains that curiosity for the reader uh, as we are still not 100% sure it actually is Hyde's voice until Hyde is uh, identified by Utterson, who of course spoke to him earlier in the novel. He said it's not Jekyll's voice, it's Hyde's. That's the reveal. And of course, it, for a first time reader, we presume that Hyde has murdered Jekyll. That's what I, what I think Stevenson wants us to think. And of course, there's a huge plot twist coming up. But we're supposed to think Hyde has murdered him, that he is... Uh, sheltering in the in the cabinet door uh, cabinet room we don't know why but he's murdered Jekyll Stevenson then maintains this tension and suspense in his description of the door that takes ages and lots of effort lots of physical exertion to actually break down um, it's almost as if he's to toying with us manipulating us uh, the frame bounded the blow fell the wood was tough and yet they can't quite break that door down enough quickly uh, and it just, that door just represents even more mystery and suspense because of course as readers we want to know what lies behind the door what is Hyde going to be like what are we go what are we going to encounter but he drops in clues doesn't he he drops in clues uh, about Hyde's identity throughout uh, and I think the most important one is the screech that we hear a dismal screech of mere animal terror which once again, it's a, it is a, it's a motif by this stage of the novel. It's a running motif that Hyde is constantly described uh, through the use of animalistic language. And here we have this animal terror, this primal noise, this primal scream, as it were, uh, from Hyde, because of course he is about to be found out. And Jekyll, uh, let's remember they're the same character, Jekyll's reputation is about to be ruined. Uh, he's about to be discovered. Um, so the mere animal terror is a great description that again is, it is subtle but it gives the reader a clue about the true identity of uh, Mr Hyde and also it follows on from the numerous descriptions in the novel that have uh, Darwinian uh, kind of echoes. So we have this description of the, of the door being tough and being difficult to break down and the description of the lock finally bursting and the, the lock in my opinion here represents a symbolically the Jekyll's secrets that are finally uh, going to be unleashed, finally going to be revealed. We then have rather, we, I, I talked about how this is the climax, but really I suppose the actual scene itself here is slightly anticlimactic. Um, it's not necessarily what we would expect given that we're about to, you know, given that they just burst into Jekyll's lair. There's something of a plot twist here. Um, rather than being a kind of demonic lair or, 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 or the den of our villain. Really we have what is can only be described as a respectable, I'll put respect, res, a respectable room, a, a respectable and dignified room uh, of a typical Victorian gentleman. And I guess that's the clue, isn't it, to the reader, that this, is the, this room actually doesn't belong to a wild, primitive man like Hyde. It's not a criminal's lair. It's the room of a respectable, 
dignified, upstanding member of society. And that's the first big clue being offered to us as readers. Why on earth would Hyde, our monstrous, you know, our monstrous villain, be living in such a well-kept and well-maintained and respectable room? We have lots of symbols for respectability and for comfort. We have the good, I'll, I'll put symbolism here. I'll put Simba. We have the fire, the kettle, the papers, the business table. All of these symbols of respectability and of class, frankly, they're, they're kind of indicators of class. They're indicators of, of a middle class, upper middle class gentleman. A business table, the fire. And of course, we have the slightly more sinister symbol of the glazed presses full of chemicals and that, that hint of the fact that we are in the rooms of that mad scientist figure, um, a bit like v Victor Frankenstein. So we have Stevenson toying with us once again. We would expect there to be much more going on in this room. We'd expect there to be a much more shocking scene. And yet, actually, the scene that we, conf we are confronted with is rather subdued, uh, r rather quaint, rather respectable. Um, and of course, I can't stress enough the point that this is altogether, the whole description here is a huge clue that, of course, Jekyll and Hyde are the same person, that Jekyll, this room is Jekyll's room. He is a respectable Victorian gentleman, and that's why it's set out in this way. We then move on to the description of the body itself and the kind of, I, I would call it the plot twist, the huge reveal that is Hyde's suicide. And it's a very shocking image. And we really, we've talked already about how Stevenson uses animalistic imagery and language to capture Hyde and to describe him. And he does this in death uh, too. He paints uh, Hyde in a very animalistic way. Right in the midst there lay the body of a sorely, uh, of a man sorely contorted and twitching. Uh, those words, again, you think, you'd think of this is, this is like a man describing a dying animal rather than a human being. And it goes back to one of the key arguments and one of the key readings that we've talked about in this series of lessons from chapter one onwards, which is why, why is Hyde presented as being subhuman? And it goes back to that allegorical significance. It goes back to the allegory of this novel. What does our Gothic monster represent? What does Hyde embody? Does he come to represent fears of Darwin's degeneration? Uh, is, does he reflect Victorian anxieties about uh, the way in which the Victorian period seems to be the end of the greatest era in British history and the beginning of a decline? Does he represent the criminal within all of us? Does he represent our worst impulses? Are we going to read this from a Freudian lens and think of Hyde as the id that uh, has to satisfy every impulsive, selfish drive? Does he represent the foreigner? Does he represent the colonial other? The figure of empire who, of course, would be encountered by... Uh, British imperialists as they ex as they expanded their empires to all four corners of the earth. What does he come to represent and why is he presented in this animistic way? It's incredibly important to think about uh, that as we come to uh, this passage. So he's twitching, he's contorted. Uh, I think even the pronoun it is quite important. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back. And it's a very, again, it feels more like a description of an animal, an animal's death than a human being, being turned on its back, the way you might inspects roadkill, for example. Uh, and then finally, it's be we beheld the face of Edward Hyde, and we have this reveal that Hyde, our gothic monster, has been killed, and, and presumably by his own hand, so Hyde is dead. Stevenson can't help but offer us clues about Hyde's true identity, and, and I think it's really important to have a think about why he might be doing that, given what's going to happen in chapter 9. He's dressed in clothes that are far too large for him. This, just like the description of the animal moti uh, motifs, this is a motif as well because throughout the novel, Hyde's clothes are always described being too large for him. It's a nice subtle clue to the reader that he's in fact wearing Jekyll's clothes, which is of course very important. We also have this idea of the cords of his face still moving with a semblance of life. Again, this animalistic kind of um, gurning, I suppose, in, in his face, which again emphasises the animalistic nature of Hyde. And then finally we have that shocking image, that the shocking image of the uh, self-inflicted uh, murder weapon, I suppose, the file in the hand. So he's killed himself by drinking poison, by drinking poison. Uh, and at, at the end of the paragraph, he's described as the body of a self-destroyer. And I think it's significant that it would be Hyde to commit such an act. Hyde would be the one who'd commit, well, at the time, I, I can't stress this enough, at the time, suicide would have been perceived 
as a mortal sin. Uh, if, you've ever, if you ever read Dante's Inferno, there's a great passage in which Dante is led through the forest of, of the suicides uh, in, in Dante's Inferno. It was seen as being uh, a particularly uh, heinous act to, to commit suicide because you were from a Christian lens, it was perceived to be destroying God's creation. Man was built in God's image, of course. So it would be Hyde, wouldn't it, who commits suicide. It would be Hyde that ends his own life by committing such a sin. Um, and the body of a self-destroyer is important. We want to know why he commits suicide, why, what drove him to it. And of course, we're about to find that out in chapter 9. Okay, let's take a checkpoint, and then we're going to look at the next section of this chapter. OK, so we've come to our checkpoint. Your suggested timings are on the screen. Please make sure you reread the passage first and answer the questions in full sentences. Feel free to pause and rewind the video if you need help. See you shortly. Welcome back. For the rest of the lesson, we are going to be considering Stevenson's use of symbolism in his description of Jekyll's cabinet and the objects and the possessions that are referred to. I, I would argue now that all of them have a symbolic significance, that both they both function as clues to the reader, but they also have a deeper symbolic meaning uh, that could be uh, useful to know in relation to the rest of the novel. So I'll start with the broken key and you may have noticed this on page 33 uh, Paul discovers this key that's clearly been trampled on um, and he, Paul says it's as if a man has stamped on it and of course the key is uh, to the cabinet so it's really important to think about the fact that and we know it's Hyde who would have, or Jekyll who would have stamped on it. Uh, Jekyll has stamped on this key which comes to represent his own self-imprisonment. He cannot trust himself anymore to leave the cabinet, so therefore he has trampled on the key and destroyed it beyond use. Um, we can assume at this point, and we know later on that this is what's happening, that he is transforming uh, kind of randomly, and he can't control the transformations anymore. So we can assume that he has decided to trample on the key in order to prevent Hyde from escaping, in order to... Uh, prevent himself from committing further crimes, but it's very ambiguous as to why he's done it. But the key represents, in my in my view, uh, and it's the idea that he is imprisoning himself within his own house. Next, I'd like to just consider the symbol which we have referred to before of the white salt that is found amongst uh, the glass saucers in the room, and the white salt I think is ob is clearly reminiscent of. Uh, cocaine, it might refer to the opium den uh, social problem that plagued Victorian London, but I think it's clearly, in my opinion, a symbol for addiction, a symbol for substance abuse, a symbol for dependency. And I think you can read this novel as being about a man trying to overcome that substance abuse, trying to overcome that addiction and suffering from relapses, falling back into the cycle of addiction. And I think this white salt is a hint at that. Obviously, drug taking is a social taboo and, 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 a, and a form of deviant behaviour. So it also represents, in some senses, Jekyll's deviance from Victorian social standards as well. But I think the white salt is, is, is an interesting motif that runs throughout the novel. OK, the next important symbol I'd like to discuss is this. It's the pious work uh, that is uh, that has been defaced and that has been... Uh, essentially annotated with startling blasphemies. That's the quotation from the, from the book. And for me, this is very interesting. This, so the pious book presumably, well, it does, it belongs to Jekyll, uh, which obviously, again, reiterates the fact that, J that Jekyll has a good side of his personality that is religious, that is respectable, that can be uh, a good person. But of course, it's been scrawled, this book, in blasphemies. And of course, that's, that's Hyde. So it represents, in a sense, uh, the fact that, that Jekyll has this evil part of him that is 
you know the devil incarnate so that, and it's almost like a kind of it's almost in, in a sense similar to how vampires in vampire fiction react to seeing the crucifix it's, it's almost a gothic trope in that sense but what i would say is that it, i also think more subtly perhaps the pious work being been covered in startling blasphemies represents the battle between good and evil that is raging within Jekyll's own mind and body at this point. Uh, we, we learn more about this, that this, about this battle and about this war between his members. I think that's how he puts it in chapter 10. So we'll read, when we look at chapter 10, we'll, we'll, we'll read that it, Jekyll's use of language is often uh, one that uses lots of phrases that you you typically associate with warfare when it comes to fighting Hyde and trying to control him. But I think it represents the evil in Jekyll uh, coming out and overcoming him and overpowering him in this sense. We then have the symbol of the fire, which I've talked about before, so I won't dwell on it for very long. But I think throughout this novel, the fire or the hearth has come to represent the isolation of these characters. Think about the number of times we've, we've encountered solitary Victorian gentlemen sitting before the hearth. Uh, so I think it represents social isolation and, and loneliness. But I also think it represents linking to the kind of broader themes and the more gothic themes of the novel. It does come to represent forbidden knowledge. It does come to represent damnation. It does come to represent evil in a sense. Uh, the fire, of course, that Prometheus stole and gave to the mortals. It, it represents that as well. So I think it's very important to... Um, think about why the fire is constantly referred to in this novel. But I think at this point, you know, closely in line with what's happened in regard to Hyde's suicide, it may well represent damnation as well. The next important symbol is on your screen. It's the cheval glass, uh, which is in the chamber. And of course, we know, we know because we aren't first time readers that the, the reason that this is an important symbol is because it was used by Jekyll to uh, watch himself transform and to test his experiments. Uh, so he could he could observe the transformation process taking place and presumably write notes on it. Uh, Paul whispers that this glass has seen some strange things. Uh, so it's kind of a gothic symbol as well. What's also interesting, uh, and I, I might be going slightly on a on a on a tangent here, but I think bear with me, is that the fire is reflected in the glass and it sparkles back a hundred repetitions. So you see, you know, uh, this kind of glorious multiplicity of, of different fires reflected back in the glass. And this might also come to represent how Jekyll's theory, which he expounds upon and develops on in chapter 10, is that actually he believes that man is made up of multiple personalities. So I think it's interesting that the reflection in the cheval glass is, a, is one of multiple images. But I think ultimately that's what Jekyll is investigating, whether or not man is made up of multiple personalities, not just two. So that's the importance of the cheval glass. It does have a kind of sinister gothic uh, aspect to it, certainly. We then have the will, which has of course been a crucial symbol and a crucial plot device, frankly, throughout the whole novel. Remember, this is what triggers Utterson to become obsessed with Hyde in the first place, and it's what triggers his investigations. And of course, the will in chapter eight has been changed. The recipient, uh, recipient rather, has become Utterson rather than Hyde, which of course, for a first time reader would, would provoke mystery and, and, and ambiguity would be wondering why has he changed uh, the the will particularly when Hyde was in was in the room so why would Hyde why would Hyde erase himself from the, from the will uh, and we learn later on of course why that is uh, it's fairly obvious but that's really important to remember that Utterson is now going to be the beneficiary of Jekyll's estate finally we have the letter and I'll read the letter out for you my dear Utterson when this shall fall into your hands I shall have disappeared under what circumstances I have not the penetration to foresee my instincts and all the circumstances of my nameless situation tell me that the end is sure and must be early. Go then, and first read the narrative which Lanyon warned me was to fall into your hands, and if you care to hear more, turn to the confession of your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. And this is a fascinating use of symbolism again, because it, it, Stevenson maintains the mystery, maintains the ambiguity. He foreshadows Jekyll's fate, so it's pretty clear from the letter that Jekyll himself uh, is doomed or has died. Uh, but we still, as a first time reader, don't know what's happened to Jekyll, of course. But it foreshadows that, not, that his fate is essentially sealed. What's interesting about this letter is it also serves as a plot device uh, because it's a series of instructions. Utterson is told to first read the narrative from Lanyon and then to read the confession of Jekyll. So really this letter frames the rest of the novel. And what's strange about the, this novel and, and its narrative structure is at the end of chapter eight when Utterson is described as uh, 
leaving the servants and go, uh, gathering, gather around the fire and trudging back to his officers to read the two narratives. In a sense, as readers, we are doing the same thing. We're placed in the same position as Utterson. We are going to be trudging back with Utterson to read those two narratives. It's almost as if we'll be sat on Utterson's shoulder in his office, reading through La uh, Lanyon's narrative and then Jekyll's narrative to finally get the full picture of what's been going on throughout the novel. And in chapter nine, we'll finally, be, we'll finally learn that Jekyll has achieved this remarkable feat in this experiment of splitting his personality in two. But it's a strange ending to the novel. We, it's, a, it's, a, it's a patchwork of a novel in some senses. It's in a way a Frankenstein's monster of different body parts assembled together. But in this, in this case, different witness statements, different documentation, uh, different perspectives, all stitched together to make a very uneven and, and uh, kind of uh, unbalanced novel in a sense. Because now we have two chapters, two quite lengthy chapters, where we go back and learn uh, and, and are finally uh, going to learn about the origin of the experiment and the implication of the experiment. But the letter is very important, like I said, as a plot device because it gives us these instructions. And, and on that note, the chapter comes to a close. OK, so we've reached the stage of another checkpoint. If you need more time, please feel free to take it. Uh, and I'd recommend now pausing the video. See you shortly. Hi there, nice to see you again. That marks the end of today's video tutorial. In tomorrow's lesson, or the next lesson rather, we're going to be looking at chapter nine, which I'll also be doing in various stages. And then obviously the final chapter, chapter 10, Jekyll's statement of the case. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.